All right, guys, how's it going? The longer I'm in this leak game, the more interesting it gets. And it's been my experience so far that people inside of companies rarely come to me when the news is good, only when it's bad. During October last year, though, the sheer volume of information that started flooding in regarding Intel made it crystal clear to me that there was something very wrong going on internally at the company. I've said this before, but I don't always report everything I hear all at the same time. And I will often sit on information until I get more of the same. For similar reasons, I'm also not so keen on talking about people who are about to be fired. My concern there is that they may be about to get fired and not to be aware of it. And I don't want to be the person who breaks that news to them. But now with so much going on at Intel, including what looks like mass layoffs, it's time to let you know everything that I know. And we'll start with a short recap. As mentioned, the meat competition slide was leaked to me in early October. It was a little risky of me to run with that, and in fact, two large publications had the chance to, but decided not to. And I know this because all three of us were in the email chain, and we had a brief discussion over it. Since that point, I've received more information from that source, which lined up perfectly with other information I had or came true very soon afterwards. In fact, that source congratulated me on my Ponte Vecchio leak soon after I first talked about it, which was on the 1st of November. And they told me to expect more news on Ponte Vecchio very soon. That was actually surprising to me because I didn't expect to hear a lot about Ponte Vecchio for some time. But on the 16th of November, Intel finally outed the codename in preparation for their HPC developer conference taking part on the 17th and 18th of November. Before all of this had happened, both myself and Matthew from the Adore TV website were given a large amount of information on both the CPU and GPU side of things in early October. After talking about it, we decided that he would run with the story over on the website. And we decided to stick mostly to the technology side of things. The article talked about Intel skipping 10 nanometers on the desktop. We noted that Tiger Lake was looking good, at least on the integrated graphics side of things. And it also talked a bit about Intel's strategy, which again referenced my meat comp slide. Also interesting was this part where Tiger Lake was designed to edge both Nvidia and AMD out of laptops. Back then, the information we were given was that XE, which is Intel's GP GPU and their discrete GPU product, otherwise known as DG1, was not shaping up particularly well. And I thought that odd because Tiger Lake was looking so good. We decided to leave that out of the article for now as well, again waiting on some corroborating information. Now here is where this part gets interesting. Intel were so spooked by our leaks that they ran an internal investigation because, from what I was told, very, very few people inside the company had access to that information. We could be talking a couple of handfuls of people who knew about this stuff. That's how high up this information was. And Intel called in an external legal firm to grill people over it. But perhaps the most telling information received around this time was on the internal politics and a huge power struggle going on at Intel. Again, before I continue with this part of the video, let me just tell you how I see this. I'm not really keen on talking about people. I would much rather talk about products. The reality here is that the people I'm going to talk about in this video, I've never met. I have absolutely nothing against any of them, and I would like it if they had nothing against me. I may end up meeting these people at some point, and I don't want bridges to be burned before it happens. Plus, I'm really not a fan of trash talking anyone unless they've started on me first. With that said, the issue here is that when talking internal politics, you simply cannot avoid naming names. All I can do in this position is report what I was told by my sources, which goes a long way to explaining why I prefer to wait and also have more sources on the same subject. But in short, it would be too easy for one person with an axe to grind with another person come to me and give me false information that was simply designed to harm that person. However, when I have multiple sources, and multiple means more than two, telling me the same thing, then I can be reasonably confident that what I'm being told is likely to be true. None of what you hear is my opinion. It's the opinion of others. So with that said, let's get on with it. Internally, Intel is in a total mess. Company-wide, 
and there are huge power struggles going on at multiple levels. We know that they hired a lot of very high-profile people in very quick succession, Raja Kaduri and Jim Keller being prime examples, and that was around a couple of years ago. One major reason why these guys were hired is that they are two of the very few senior executives at Intel who actually understand technology. But Raja is all about his ego. Again, not my words. Now, when I was told this, I recalled an article over at Hard OCP a few years ago during the point at which AMD were about to launch Polaris. It was titled, From ATI to AMD Back to ATI? A Journey in Futility. Kyle had clearly been sitting on some pretty good information regarding the internal politics at AMD, and both Raja Kaduri and Chris Hook came under fire. The article states, After conversations with a number of current and recently departed employees from AMD, a clear picture emerged. A picture ripe with tension, blind ambition, and backwards thinking. Starting with the tension, Kaduri apparently threatened to quit AMD and join Intel. This article was from May 2016, remember. Raja joined Intel at the end of 2017, unless Lisa Su gave him the top GPU job and allowed him to form the Radeon Technologies Group. Lisa caved in to his demands. However, that's obviously not a very solid foundation to work on, and rather unsurprisingly led to a dysfunctional and acrimonious relationship between the CEO and the head of the Radeon Technologies Group, with the article going on to talk about Raja's unwavering ambition. As I said, hearing something once doesn't make it true. Not twice, but when you hear it for the third and fourth times, you start to believe that it probably is. Around the middle of November, I caught wind of an interesting thread over at Reddit. Intel's Odyssey to Nowhere. I'll go over the guts of it quickly. In February, that was 2019, Intel announced Odyssey, a series of magical events that promised to not only take GPU enthusiasts and game developers along for the ride, but promised that Intel would integrate these people into first-hand GPU development reporting and most importantly, garner feedback from its target audience. This was the basis of Intel's GPU initiatives, led by Raja Kaduri and Chris Hook. However, similar in many respects to the waning Team Red strategy at AMD, Odyssey events were touted all over the world, including but not limited to Bangalore, Beijing, Dublin, London, and it went on and on and on. Going back to the Hard OCP article, and we see that Hook came under fire for a similar kind of strategy. The accusation being that whenever AMD had nothing much of a product, Hook tended to go overboard on the marketing side of things. Putting on lavish events for the press was always Hook's marketing strategy, in fact. Even when there were great products, like in the case of AMD's 4000 series cards. At that time, he organised an event on an aircraft carrier off the coast of California. Back to the Reddit post and it ended with, The Odyssey seemed to be more about ego and posturing rather than about actual product. Anyone thinking that Intel's DG1 card is going to be more than a prototype for developers is kidding themselves. Intel has seen the light and realised that it pushed the go button way too early. And it seems that Intel is now learning from AMD's missteps of the past to not overpromise and underdeliver. A day or two later, I received an email from one of my sources inside of Intel. It simply says, Kaduri and Hook have lost all control over Odyssey. All the marketing money has been taken away because of how badly it's been handled. Intel didn't like the craziness around no product. And there was also confirmation of the Reddit information, which stated, DG1 won't be a consumer product. It will be a developer product and perhaps even given away for free. And then even more confirmation with, Intel are very upset with Odyssey and all those big events that were planned have been cancelled. So perhaps it wasn't really surprising when I received another email a couple of days later saying, all the marketing money has been removed from DG and XE. And finally, Hook is gone. A short while later, Semi-Accurate reported that both Chris Hook and Heather Lennon, who were responsible for Intel's Odyssey marketing program, had left the company. Whether they had left or were pushed, it's rather clear that these two are the fall guys for a bad product. That's the reality here. They were brought in to market a gaming GPU that was never likely to be good enough to hit the market. A couple of weeks ago, Matthew at the website was given some great information from an industry insider on Intel's future plans. First of all was the very surprising news that DG2 
will be fabbed on TSMC's 7 nanometer node, not Intel's. As DG2 is expected in 2022, this was a real surprise. However, with hindsight, it makes sense if this is Raj's first full GPU design at Intel. Raj has been building GPUs on TSMC's nodes for years, and not all nodes are the same. Part of the reason for XE's and DG1's failure will undoubtedly be down to the woeful 10 nanometer node. TSM 7 nanometers is a great node. Our information is that Intel's 7 nanometers is not well tuned for GPU, which possibly means it's been tuned for low power. And Matthew ended the article by saying that while rumours should be taken with a grain of salt, we are very confident in this specific one. And the next day he released a second article, Intel Rocket Lake CPUs will use separate dies for the integrated graphics. The CPU cores are still on 14 nanometers and the GPU cores are 10 nanometers. So that was two pretty big leaks for Matthew. And this 7 nanometer one in particular did pretty well. And there was more information than just this. He was also told that Ari Rock might be getting fired. And you can see here that we chatted about it and decided not to run with that story. That goes back to that whole thing about me not really being willing to talk about people getting fired. As you can see, this was on the 19th of the month. WCCF ran with the story five days later. And Intel finally confirmed that he would be changing roles. The reason I'm mentioning this stuff isn't because I want to say we were first or anything like that. We weren't first, WCCF Tech were first. Because first of the info counts for nothing unless you're willing to publish that info. I'm just mentioning this so that you realise that the sources we have on all of this stuff I'm talking about here are extremely reliable. Every one of my sources at Intel starts by saying the same thing about Ari. He's a nice guy. Before Raja got there, Ari originally had hardware, architecture, software, and the business and the marketing side to deal with though software is much more of his area of expertise. I think it's safe to say that that's a lot for one person to deal with, and he basically lost all of those positions to other people over time. What exactly he's doing at Intel now, I'm not sure. However, he was seen talking to Gordon of PC World on the 9th of January, when Intel finally admitted that DG1 would be a developer product only. So what has gone wrong at Intel's graphics? Well, recently, I talked to one of my sources at their behest and I was given a ton of information that was just absolute gold. XE, codenamed Arctic Sound, started out as a custom-built GPU for streaming. Intel promised their cloud customers that they'd build a streaming GPU that was better than any CPU or any fixed function hardware. And at first, the idea was very well received. So Intel started to build that GPU. However, at some point along the line, the cloud guy started to ask the question, does quality really matter all that much? People watch Netflix and Amazon. Quality doesn't really matter that much to them. It's reached that good enough point already. And essentially, the cloud guys figured that paying Intel for this GPU didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So Arctic Sound was shaping up to be a streaming GPU that, after thinking about it, nobody actually wanted. This was before Raja even got to Intel. And so one of the first things he did was he decided to add inference capability to the GPU. Basically, add a bunch of fixed function hardware, and it was now a general purpose GPU, or a GP GPU. The problem though is it's using die area and power on this whole streaming thing that the GPU was originally designed for. So the inferencing part of it is in no way competitive against current offerings on the market. In the words of my source, Raja made changes, now it's the worst of all worlds. And it's now a part that is horrible at everything. But Intel will forge ahead with it anyway. From what I can gather, each GPU is actually four dies of around about 150 square millimetres each. Or at least I was given the figure of 606 square millimetres on 10 nanometers plus plus plus. And a combined total of around about 24 billion transistors. It will be available with one, two, and four tiles, as we've seen in these XE marketing documents. So a quad tile will have 12 GPUs connected with EMIB. It's based on Gen 12 graphics and has HBM2E. My source was very complimentary about Tiger Lake's integrated graphics, saying that it should make the MX250 go away if it's marketed correctly. 
They then proceeded to tell me a bizarre story of mixed messaging out of Intel's client computing group. Apparently, one group within CCG told the laptop makers, don't bother making anything with entry-level discrete graphics anymore. Basically, they were trying to convince the laptop guys, there's no need for NVIDIA's MX250 anymore, because Tiger Lake is so good. However, at the same time, another group within CCG were trying to sell the entry-level DG1 graphics that we just saw to the same parties. And this kind of incompetence is sadly rife all over Intel, it seems. And my source started dropping bombs every few seconds. And I quote, Intel's mentality is, we decide what the customer wants. There is no customer-centric way of thinking. Intel doesn't understand community. It's amazing how disconnected Intel is from the market. We are just so arrogant. And somewhat depressingly, on the graphic side of things, I'm watching it disintegrate before my eyes, and it's the fall of Intel graphics. And the last noteworthy quote will lead me on nicely to the final part of the information. It's a clown show. A few years ago, Intel started a program of game developer partnerships, which included Intel doing their marketing for them. And for a change, they weren't actually asking for a whole lot in return. We've seen this in games like Total War Warhammer 2, with Intel sponsoring the benchmark. The cost of all this apparently ran into billions of dollars of investment over a number of years. As we know, for years games were all about the single-threaded performance, then they maybe scaled decently up to four cores before kind of plateauing at that point. This is why the i5s generally match the i7s. And it also just happens that Intel had four cores in the mainstream market for years, and they were able to increase performance marginally each generation through small IPC and clock speed gains. So all was good, according to them. The newer CPUs were always just a little bit faster than the older ones in gaming. However, the clock speed gains basically hit a wall around the 22 nanometers and 14 nanometers marks. And in fact, clock speeds started to retreat early on on the new process. And that simply meant that they could no longer rely on clock speed to sell new CPUs each generation. And if you remember, Broadwell was well down in Haswell's clock speeds, but it was just about saved by the inclusion of that large L4 crystal well cache, which worked pretty well in games actually. But that was not really a viable option in the long run. So in return for Intel's investment, they made only one request of the game developers. Ensure that their games scale better with more cores. Billions of dollars of investment over the past few years just to get developers to make games scale better on the CPU. At this point, my source asked me, Jim, can you see the obvious problem with this strategy? To which I instantly responded, AMD are increasing their CPU core count an awful lot faster. Yeah, we just laughed and laughed and laughed. It's true, Intel had improved the performance on their new CPUs over their earlier quads. In fact, the i5 died very quickly over a short period of about a year, which is faster than even I thought would happen. The problem for Intel was that their relative performance against AMD was now closer than ever due to this expensive program. With my source ending with, Intel has done more to close the gap with AMD over the years than AMD ever did. And essentially, this has all come about due to sheer arrogance. And those were my source's words, not mine. Nobody at Intel even bothered to wonder what enabling AMD would mean. It was all about Intel beating Intel. And at this point, my source clarified that they weren't suggesting Intel should be anti-competitive or anything like that. However, they need to be a bit more aggressive than simply enabling their competition like they have been. And from a business perspective, I agree with that. From a consumer's perspective though, I'm glad to see Intel doing more for gamers. Right, time to finish this one off. As I said at the top of this video, I am not happy to diss people for no good reason, and I have absolutely nothing against Raja. In fact, I always thought he was quite amiable, and I enjoyed his style on stage. With that said, there's no way I keep hearing about this same ego thing unless it's true. And you know what? I am not even particularly bothered about ego if that is true. Raja's real problem is the products he has been responsible for. I was going to release a video late last year on the worst PC tech products of the decade. Vega came second. Fermi was third. You can probably figure what came first or last, depending on how you look at it. 
But basically, that means that Raja is responsible for the second worst PC product in the past 10 years. As we heard, Arctic Sound development had already started before Raja got to Intel. It was a custom streaming GPU that nobody wanted. Raja made the decision to turn it into a GP GPU with inferencing, and now it's the worst of all worlds. His fault? I don't think he can solely take the blame for this, at least. If nobody wanted a custom streaming GPU, he had to do something to change that. Was his choice the right one? Probably not. But also, with it being on Intel's 10 nanometers, there's only so good it can possibly be. Designing DG2 for TSMC makes perfect sense. This one is almost certainly Raja's first full design at Intel, but I've heard rumours that it'll be around 2070 performance, which in 2022 isn't really gonna cut it. However, I'm not sure how believable those rumours are, as 2022 is still some distance away. If DG2 is Raja's first full design at Intel, then it needs to be a home run. There can be no more excuses for failure, not even Intel's bad manufacturing nodes. I am rooting for Intel's GPU division because we badly need strong competition for Nvidia. Tiger Lake looks like it will be a great leap forward for Integrated, so perhaps there's something there to work with in future. For me though, that future is only likely to be seen with DG3 and 2023 at the earliest, by which point I'm not sure if Raja will still be there, I'm afraid. So, how confident am I in this information that I have given you today? 100%. Barring the usual bit of possible crossed wires, the information I've given you today is 100% real. I know my sources on this, and what's more, there will be a lot more coming on this topic in future. As always, don't forget to check out the website for the new articles, and I'll catch you later, guys.